In this video, I want to talk about compressors. Now, compressors are considered the heart of the refrigeration system, and they're one of the major components of a refrigeration system. So let's go ahead and start by talking about the different types of compressors. We have five types of compressors. I have a rotary compressor, I have a scroll compressor, I have a screw compressor, I have a centrifugal compressor, and I have a reciprocating compressor. Rotary compressors, where we're going to start, because they're the smallest. They're usually very small and lightweight. They use blades or vanes to move the refrigerant. It's not a piston-type action. They contain an off eccentric, which is just off-center. In other words, the shaft is not in the center of the rotor, so it moves side to side. This rotor rotates inside a cylinder. The suction and the discharge ports are on the opposite sides. The dome is on the high side. Okay, and this again is just a picture of this whole idea. So the dome is on the discharge port. It is on the high side. The suction line is on the side. It comes in from the side at the bottom, and then the, the refrigerant is pushed through and out the top. The suction line directly is on the compressor. Discharge line connects directly to the center of the dome. The centrifugal force that's generated by this rotating rotor or uh, motor inside of here and the blades separates the oil from the gas. So the majority of the oil actually does stay in the compressor here. There are two types of rotary compressors. One is called a stationary vane or blade. It has a blade, blade or vane, either way, uh, and a shaft with an off-center rotor and a discharge valve. The rotary vane or blade has two or more sliding vanes. The advantages of a rotary compressor, the efficiency is extremely high. It's much higher than a reciprocating compressor. By the way, reciprocating compressor means that we have pistons that move up and down. It can pull a deeper vacuum because there's no dead or unused space and because the um, oil does stay in it. It's less apt to blow fuses on startup because, again, we don't have a piston that starts moving the refrigerant. We have a rotating device that just goes with the motor. You'll find these rotary compressors pretty frequently in residential air conditioning systems. The rotary compressor usually includes a check valve in the discharge side of the compressor to prevent vapor and compressor oil from flowing back to the evaporator. The next type of compressor we're going to talk about is the scroll compressor. Again, it's not a piston action. The scroll compressor is the newest type of compressor out there. It does not have any valves. And again, I want you to think about a car engine or even the up and down of an air compressor that uses valves and pistons to move the refrigerant and to increase the pressures. The scroll compressor doesn't have valves. The refrigerant vapor is basically squeezed through a scroll, like a rolled up piece of paper, thus increasing the pressures. Okay, this is an example of a cutaway of a Copeland scroll compressor. You can usually tell the scroll compressors because you have a very large motor component that's down near the bottom, and your refrigerant lines come in pretty close together. The scroll is at the top, okay, and then the other portion is at the bottom. Now what happens if you look closely at this top component, it's a blue, you'll see that it's color-coded here. This isn't the way it is in a compressor, of course. But you have a blue and red scroll here. Those components sort of rotate, sort of, in more of an elliptical pattern, back and forth. And it squeezes the refrigerant through this scroll until the high-pressure refrigerant comes out of the top. It has very little wear and tear. They really only have three moving parts. One of the scrolls, okay, and the discs. The upper disc is stationary. The lower disc is driven. The driven scroll moves in an orbiting motion. That's connected to an off-center or eccentric motor. During the operation, the vapor is trapped between the scrolls, and it's compressed by the orbiting motion. So this is a, just an example of what happens. Again, we pull refrigerant in here. We start it through the scroll process, and the refrigerant will eventually get compressed as it moves through the center. 
and it will come out the okay so again we have the refrigerant moving through here it can be noisy on startup and shutdown when it gets over three tons now remember a ton of refrigerant okay so it, the larger units, especially on air conditioning systems, the older scroll compressors were noisy. Some manufacturers have installed a solenoid valve between the suction and the discharge lines to equalize the pressure, and that will counteract the noise. The valve is wired in parallel with the contacts of a single pole contactor. Until recently, the scroll was only used in systems up to five tons. Now, we have scrolls that are in most sizes under 20 tons. Once you hit 20 tons, you get into some larger compressors that we'll talk about in a few minutes. This is an example of a cutaway of a scroll compressor. Of course, you don't normally see duct tape on these things. We put that there to protect people's fingers. Okay, the top comes off. You have your scroll component here. Okay, you have oil, you have some equalization lines. Your whole motor component is down here at the bottom. This whole area is surrounded with refrigerant. Okay, you pull the scroll apart. You can actually see the scroll. And by scroll, again, I mean a, a, co a loose coil almost. And these two parts fit together. The bottom one rotates. The top one is stationary. The motor... This is what we mean by an off-center motor or an eccentric motor. This whole thing rotates. You see right there where my mouse pointer is, if you can see that. It rotates right there. While the shaft is not in the center of that piece that rotates. So as this rotates, it sort of does a back and forth motion. That's what makes the scroll drive in an off-center idea to press the refrigerant through it. The refrigerant migration refers to the movement of liquid refrigerant to the compressor crankcase. It's a term you need to know, refrigerant migration. This migration happens when the compressor is off and is colder than the evaporator. Liquid refrigerant will always move to the coldest spot in the system. So if the compressor is shut down outside on a negative 10 degree day, and if the indoor unit is only 32 or 30, 30 degrees, if like as a refrigerator, the liquid refrigerant is going to migrate to the compressor. What this causes is a violent foaming on startup, okay, which will push the oil out of the crankcase into the refrigeration system, and you can have severe compressor damage. The use of crankcase heaters and pump down controls can reduce and stop the refrigerant migration during the compressor off cycle. We can actually heat that system outside, okay, that you through a crankcase heater, and we can stop that. We can also pump down the refrigerant, get it out of the compressor, get it out of the evaporator, and into a receiver. And this will stop the migration during the off cycle. So thus far we've talked about rotary and scroll compressors. The next type of compressor that I want to talk about is a very large commercial unit like the one that I have on the screen here in front of us, okay? This is a screw compressor. It's used on large chilled water and refrigeration systems. It's only available in sizes 20 tons and up. It has very little vibration and it uses a special helical motor or rotors or screws to move and compress the refrigerant. Okay, this is an example of a trained chiller that happens to have one of these. Okay, the inside of this, very large compressors. The way the screw compressor works is we pull refrigerant in the inlet of the compressor. And then you see that there's two screws that work together and co slowly compress this refrigerant and push it out of the discharge side of the compressor. So it's, you basically, if you take two wood screws and put them against each other, you'll see that this action occurs as you rotate both screws. Screw compressors operate smoothly, even when capacity is reduced as low as 10%. So I can actually reduce the flow of refrigerant or reduce the speed of the compressor, and I can lower capacity to about 10%. In other words, so I can ramp up and ramp down these depending on change of demand.
Capacity control on screw compressors is accomplished by recirculating the refrigerant vapor inside the compressor. So what I can do is I can actually take some of this discharge vapor and put, allow it to come back into the inlet so I can actually reduce the amount of vapor that's being sent out. The other thing, more recently, we can control capacity with variable speed motors by ramping up and down the speed of these motors. The refrigerant vapor is drawn into the spaces between the lobes of the screw. As the void, that's the open area between the screw, gets smaller, the gas is compressed and piped to the condenser. Screw compressors come in various types. You have hermetic, semi-hermetic, and open or external drive. Again, very little vibration as there's a continuous pumping action. There's no back and forth action. Okay, this is just another picture of a screw compressor. The refrigerant vapor comes in and is slowly pushed. Starts off wide, gets narrower and narrower as the pressure goes up and then comes out the outlet. This is an example of a centrifugal chiller. Okay, it's yet another type of compressor, centrifugal. It's used in large commercial systems. It uses impellers of wheels. It operates at an extremely high speed. Vapors move rapidly in a circular path using centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is that force, if you, if you spin something very rapidly, it's going to fly in an outwards direction or push in an outwards direction. Okay, so vapors very move very rapidly in a circular pattern using the centrifugal force. So we pull vapor in our suction line, and as this spins, okay, in the compressor housing, as the impeller spins, it's going to increase the pressure and push it out the outlet pipe or discharge. The compression is caused by spinning the mass of vapor refrigerant at high speeds. The outward spinning refrigerant is then caught in a channel. It is then compressed by the flow of refrigerant that's constant behind it. In a centrifugal compressor, again, there's no valves. Refrigerant enters through the suction inlet, then through the suction passages into the first wheel. The refrigerant enters the wheel through openings near the shaft. Okay, and this again, we can have multi-stages. We can have different types of centrifugal compressors. Refrigerant is then slung outwards. It is then forced through the discharge outlet onto the onto the condenser. Lubrication is needed only at the end of the bearings. Therefore, centrifugal compressors are mostly oil-free, another plus for a large system. I don't want large quantities of oil being moved through the refrigerant cylinders. They do not need any valves or pistons, and they're very high speed, so things being serviced properly makes a big difference on these. Now, the most common type of compressor you're going to see right now in refrigeration is the reciprocating compressor. It's used in domestic and commercial refrigeration systems. They are piston types. The normal RPMs for this, the older units operate at 1725 RPM. The newer units at 3450 RPM. Notice the up and down movement. Okay, the reciprocating action. Okay, the piston moves on an off-center rotor, and then there's valves, okay? So on the downward action, my suction valve opens. On the upward action or discharge, on the high side, my discharge valve opens, and then will reclose to prevent the refrigerant from coming back into the chamber. These compressors are hermetically sealed, Okay, motor and compressors are sealed into a steel dome. External switching must be provided. The dome is on the low side of the system. The suction line ends at the steel dome. It fills the dome with low temperature vapor. There's sometimes an optional oil cooler. It's not present on all models. In addition to a loop of pipe going through the crankcase, okay, we have we basically take our um discharge line, loop it back through the crankcase, and what that does, it removes the heat from the oil, and it actually can help cool the system. The main parts of the reciprocating compressor, you have a cylinder, you have a piston, you have connecting rods, a crankshaft, a cylinder head, and valves. 
The crankcash, crank, crankshaft and connecting rod change the rotating motion of the motor into a reciprocating motion, and I just showed you that on a picture. The reciprocating motion causes an up and down motion in the pistons. When the piston is at the bottom of the stroke, the suction valve is open and the cylinder fills with low temperature, low pressure vapor. As the piston travels up, the suction valve closes. The cylinder pressure is greater than the suction pressure. When the piston is at the top, the temperature and pressure have increased. And whenever we compress a gas, we increase the temperature. A predetermined pressure opens the discharge valve. High temperature, high pressure vapor flows onto the condenser. There is a dead space between the top of the piston and the valve space. We can't get all of the refrigerant out of there. The dead space, also referred to as clearance volumes, is one of the reasons the compressor is not 100% efficient. So what we have here is this, this is the downward portion. So that number one is my suction line coming in and allowing my low temperature, low pressure refrigerant into the cylinder. Okay, then as the cylinder or the piston moves up, it's going to force my suction valve closed. And when the pressure is high enough, it's going to force my discharge valve open to push that refrigerant out. The problem is this piston cannot move all the way up. It cannot remove all of the refrigerant out or it would slam its top against this top of the cylinder and do some damage. So I always have a little bit of refrigerant in here. How much refrigerant determines a lot about how efficient my compressor is. How much refrigerant is not being moved out of my compressor. Reciprocating compressors are not 100% efficient. There's always some loss. And this again just shows you a little bit more about the discharge flapper valve, the top of the refrigerant, and how it's pushed out. Reciprocating compressors are categorized by housings and by drive mechanisms. Housing categories are hermetic, semi-hermetic, or open. The hermetic is a fully welded. The motor and the compressor are contained inside a single shell that is welded closed. You might hear to it sometimes referred to as a tin can, okay? But it's a hermetic compressor. You cannot service a hermetic compressor without cutting the shell open. The compressors are disposable. They're cooled with the suction vapor. This is an example of a, co of a reciprocating compressor. Pop it open at the weld joint. You see the motor, the windings, and everything inside. My start components go out here and you have lines that are directly welded into the system. You can actually pull it open and down here surrounding the motor is where your valves are and the shell of the system. Semi-hermetic is just a step away from that. It's a little bit more of an ex more expensive system. The motor and compressor are contained inside a single shell that is bolted together. You can service the inside components of these by removing the bolts after, of course, you recover all the refrigerant out of the system, and opening. Generally, they use what we call a splash-type lubricating system in the smaller compressor or a pressure lubricating system in the larger compressors by use of an oil pump. They're air-cooled as well as vapor-cooled. Fins on the casting or the external shell of the compressor allow the increased surface area so we can air cool them. Fan is mounted on top of the compressor and blowing air across it. Occasionally you'll see some in hotter environments that are water cooled and by use of a water jacket around the compressor. And a water jacket just includes tubes where water circulates through the tubes. The open compressors Okay, or another type of reciprocating compressor. The open compressor is different because its compressor and motor are separate. They're connected by belts or special couplings. The compressor can be serviced or rebuilt in the field, but the biggest issue with these is that they develop leaks at the shaft seal. The open compressor shaft seals, okay, are around the, sh around the drive shafts. Okay, but they're designed to prevent refrigerant leaks, but they just wear out over time. 
The seal has two rubber surfaces. One surface turns with the crankshaft and is sealed to the shaft with the O-ring. The other surface is stationary and is mounted to the shaft housing. The rubbing surface can be made from hardened steel or bronze, ceramic and carbon, Teflon or graphite. These surfaces have to be lubricated. It's part of the preventative maintenance is to lubricate any shaft seals. We have four types of shaft seals. We have a packing gland, a stationary unbalanced, a diaphragm type, and a rotary. Now, back to our drive types. We also have semi-hermetic, the compressor and motor are combined in one housing. The compressor can be serviced in the field, but the service is limited. And we have hermetic, the compressor and motor are combined in one housing that is welded closed. It's not serviceable at all. Most of the more expensive and higher end systems and the upper end systems will use semi-hermetic compressors. Pistons in these, compre in these reciprocating compressors can have 1 to 16. The arrangement can be vertical with 1 to 3 cylinders, V-type with 2, 4, 6, W-type in multiples of 3, or radials in multiple of 5, or X-type in multiples of 4. Okay, semi-hermetic compressors have an appearance of this. Okay, this is an example of a semi-hermetic compressor on a shop bench. You'll see that it's all bolted together. Your start components and all your wiring connects uh, over here. You start taking the bolts apart off the cover. You pop the cover off and you can see your valves and pistons. Okay, my valves are under the cover here. Okay. You take the front of it off, you can see the end of the motor with a splash type lubricating system. This is, a, this is two blades that actually circulate down here to the bottom and pick up the oil and splash it across the bearings. The lifespan and efficiency of a compressor is 100% based on the maintenance of the system. Dirty condenser coils and improper charges can overheat a compressor and raise the pressures too high. This affects both efficiency and lifespan. The dirtier the coil, the hotter the compressor, the higher the amperages, the more strain on the motor. Multiple compressors provide capacity control. You can control capacity with more than one compressor. If you use less load, you don't turn on all the compressors. To check valves, okay, basically you can do it with your gauges. You install the gauges on the unit, bleed the air to the service valves, jump the low pressure control. We don't want this thing to shut off on low pressure. Start your compressor. Turn the low side valves in by two turns. Read the low side pressure. In other words, we crack the valve. Turn the high side valve in by two turns. Read the high side pressure. Okay, in other words, you've now opened your service valves to mid-seat, you've read your pressures. Now you're going to front seat the low side service valve, that's all the way in. You're going to read the low side pressure. You want to reach 20 inches of mercury in less than two minutes. Your low side valves are good. In other words, we want to pull the system into a vacuum. Don't let it run in a vacuum for very long, though. It's not a good idea. If a 20-inch vacuum cannot be reached in two minutes, low side valves are bad. You really don't have a choice. You're going to end up either replacing the valves if it's semi-hermetic or replacing the compressor. Next, stop the compressor with the low side valves front seated. Read the low side pressure. If your pressure remains lower than 20-inch vacuum, your discharge valves are good. In other words, we don't want the refrigerant to come back through the high side into the compressor. If the pressure remains lower than 20 inch vacuum, discharge valves are good. If the pressure rises above 20 inch vacuum, then the discharge valves are bad. Replace them. Notice we did not front seat the discharge service valves while the system was running. Okay, to finish up, backseat both valves and remove your gauges. Of course, do the pump down of your gauges procedure so you don't let a lot of liquid refrigerant out. There are three types of lubrication system. You have splash type, you have forced lubrication,
and there the force lubrication is used on three horsepower larger systems. The splash type uses fingers on a shaft which splash oil up into the pistons of the shaft. I showed you one of that in my semi-hermetic compressor that we had open on this shop bench. It's used in older compressors. Forced lubrication, okay, is done in two ways. Smaller systems, three horsepower below, use a crankshaft and piston movement to force the oil to the bearings. Okay, sometimes a combination of fingers on the shaft and forced lubrication is used. Larger systems use an external oil pump that's mounted on the sh rear shaft bearing housing. Oil is forced through a mechanical set of series of holes onto the compressor bearings and connecting rods. The oil pump intake is connected to the compressor crankcase. Oil pump intake pressure is always equal to the low side pressure. That's also known as crankcase pressure. So my oil pump intake is the low side pressure. Oil pump outlet pressure is the sum of the crankcase pressure plus the pump pressure. So net oil pump pressure is equal to suction pressure subtracted from the oil pump discharge pressure. An oil pressure switch works off the net oil pressure and net oil pressure is normally between 30 to 40 psi. But again, check manufacturer's directions. A bypass valve can be added to in cases of high oil pressure to keep the pressure under 60 psi. That bypass valve is normally not adjustable. Refrigerant migration, we've talked about once before, but refrigerant migration is the movement of liquid refrigerant back to the compressor crankcase. It is one of the biggest issues in refrigeration when you have your unit, when you have the condensing unit mounted outside the building, okay, in a cold climate. The liquid refrigerant is going to migrate on it. The liquid refrigerant, when the system's off, is always going to migrate to the coldest spot. If the coldest spot is the compressor, it's going to mix with the oil, and it's going to cause violent foaming on the startup, and it's going to push the oil right out of the compressor. Well, a compressor will not run long without oil. We use a crankcase heater and a pump down to reduce and stop the refrigerant migration during the compressor off cycle. 